Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Briefing Trading Webinar. My name is Mike Midland, and I'll be hosting the call. I want to start off by giving everyone a little background on Briefing.com for those who are new to the service. For the past 20 years, Briefing has provided live coverage and analysis of the equity markets. Briefing Trader is our premium service and provides streaming market coverage as well as premium trading ideas from our senior analyst. Today, we're going to discuss tips to help you navigate the site and easily find trading opportunities on the website that match your trading style. We also discuss some hot topics such as the state of the market, the market technicals, the price of oil, potential value stocks in the energy sector, distressed opportunities in the energy sector, and taking advantage of intraday volatility. I will be joined by four of our senior analysts. Now, each trading analyst has a handle or custom ticker that matches their style so they are easily identified and you can quickly search for the trades or comments. The four analysts here today are Brett Manning, whose handle is Chart, Scott Smith, who goes by Blue X, Mike Ciccarelli, who is Comdex, and Damon Southward, our chief market strategist, whose ticker is Scalp. So let's get started now. Okay, everyone should be seeing here shortly our dual in-play page. This is the default entry page for Briefing Trader. On the left, you're going to have a live stream of market coverage, such as news, earnings, upgrades, downgrades, technical levels for stocks and indices, etc. Now, on the right, you're going to get our premium content. This will be the day trading and swing trading calls by all our analysts and traders. Now let's talk about filters for a little bit and drill down on this page. Each page can be filtered to limit the content that appears on it. So as you see here, as I click on filter, it shows all the topics are checked. So we get all the news for every, every topic. If we want to drill down a little bit more, maybe we have somebody who's only interested in broker research and earnings. So if I, ch if I check all topics, and then hit preferences for broker research, commentary, earnings, and maybe somebody just trades IPOs as well. I can check those and then click OK. Now this will just give me news for those specific items I checked. We can also filter trading calls the same way. Now as I slide over here to the premium side of all our trading calls, if I go to the filter, the default page is set for all trading calls. As I scroll down here. So say somebody's just interested in swing trades. If I check all trading calls and then go ahead and check swing trades and click OK, then I'll just get the swing trading calls. So maybe for somebody who's not as active in the market and is uh, into, interested in longer term trades, just swing trades. So, so that's a little bit just on moving around the dual and play page. So now I'm going to shift over to custom tickers. You click up here on the orange tab, it says custom tickers. We'll just take a second to load here. Okay, here we go. I mentioned that each trader has their own ticker. So this is something that Briefing came up with years ago to help you easily navigate the site and find content in seconds. So as you look through here, you've got a bunch of different traders from Beta X to Blue X to Event, Momo, Scalp, Style, and Setup. You can also access content through our topic-based tickers. So I'm just going to do a quick search on these. So say you go down here to Inside, which talks specifically about insider trading, commentary, and analysis. So I'm going to close out this for a second and do a search for Inside. You basically just go up here to the search field, type in IN, SID, and enter, and it's going to bring up all the insider news and insider commentary recently. So as you can see here today, this is the later, latest uh, insider news. So interesting to see maybe if the market being hammered, if some insiders are stepping up to the plate. And you can see there's, you know, this, this is probably just a little anecdotal, but there's a lot more buyers and sellers. Um, it looks like Berkshire Hathaway here has picked up some more shares. So Warren's got some deep pockets, obviously. Okay, so I'm going to close that out. And we can also search by specific traders. So let's go up here again in the search field, and I'll type in a custom ticker. So let's type in Blue X, and we'll be able to see his comments and his analysis in any recent trades. 
So I'm going to do a search here, and here it comes up. Here's some midday notes, and here's a recent trade on Macy's. So it looks like there's a nice four-point gain there. So that was a nice trade recently by Blue X. Okay, so I'm going to close out that. And although dual and play is where most of our clients spend their time, we recommend starting your trading day by visiting some of our premium research reports. And the way you can find these is scrolling up here to the Investing and Trading tab. So if I click on this, it gives you just a detail on all our fundamental research. And I'm going to scroll down here to uh, one of the best places basically to get started to get a big picture sense of the markets ahead of the opening bell is a column that's titled ETF Daily Notes. So I'm going to grab it right here and pull it up. And this is our primary pre-market macro strategy piece. Brett Manning, aka Chart Trader, is the author of this column each morning. Brett's currently short the market from a strong entry in mid-December, drawing off his analysis. So we're going to bring in Brett now a little bit to talk about that strategy and just how he generally approaches things and what he's keying off right now and what suddenly has become a very interesting market for macro traders. So I'll throw it over to Brett. Brett, are you there? Yep. Hey, thanks a lot, Mike. Okay, can I get a slide number one up? So um, as you guys are going to see, my name is Brett Manning. Uh, I go by Chart Trader on the site, as he said earlier, and the tickers I use are Chart and ETFXX, and I come at things okay, from a slightly weird. different perspective. Are you hearing me? We're good with slide one. Nope. Sorry, Brett, to interrupt you there. Go ahead. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, just for your information, guys, I'm out in California, so we're kind of coordinating this. But, yeah, it looks like, Mike, I've got a good feed, so you don't have to worry about it. All right, so um, as I was saying, I come at things from a slightly different perspective here than I think most of the other traders at briefing because I take, a, at this point in my career, a pretty strict top-down macro approach. And to do that, I mostly use futures markets for execution of my trades. Um, and, you know, the reason is when compared to ETFs, futures have 24-hour liquidity. The stops will always trigger. Transaction costs are much lower. Taxation terms are much, much lower for capital gains. Not a lot of people realize that. We should look it up. Um, however, I do use ETF uh, versions of my trades at times myself, and I generally highlight them. So if you're not comfortable with futures, you can follow my trading strategy in this sort of macro perspective using ETFs. But if you want to look at futures, if you're experienced with futures, whatever, I did, a, 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 I think, actually a very good webinar called Introduction to Futures Trading that you'll find on the Briefing TV YouTube page. If you navigate over to that, it's about an hour long. I talk about my experience and all the details of how to get started, whether you're brand, brand new at futures or if you've been doing it for 10 years, I, I think it's a, a valuable resource, so I, I encourage you to take a look. Um, you can see some of my most productive recent positions listed there, and I'm not claiming that every position I put out or every idea is going to work out like this, but I just kind of want to point out that taking this perspective on markets, trading things like the bond market, gold, you know, the indexes can lead to tremendously profitable results. It's, there are ways to make money in markets that aren't just about you know, buying a, an under 10 stock at huge leverage and watching it triple. There's lots of ways to play this game where you can really, really significantly increase your capital. Okay, next slide, Mike. Okay. All right. Um, so I'm briefing. Uh, I provide content pretty much along two lines, an index analysis side and a trading activity side. In terms of the analysis, I post a macro note each morning. You looked at it earlier when Mike took you over to the ETF daily notes. It's about 15 minutes before the bell. It's a, it's a macro strategy note. It's not pinned down just to ETFs. That's sort of a legacy title. Pretty much everything top down, what interests me at that moment, and also kind of continuing on some of the themes that we've talked about. And I also post a larger strategy piece each month called the Macro Chart Book. Um, that goes under the ETFXX ticker. Uh, in addition, I post a real-time trading calls and analysis throughout the day under my chart ticker. Uh, next slide, Mike. Okay. All right. So uh, I want to spend just a few minutes setting the scene and talking about this market environment so you can get a better feeling of what I do and also where my thoughts are right now. So uh, in the November edition of the Macro Chart Book, I started off with a section I called The Story So Far. And I want to do a real quick The Story So Far that basically encompasses the last year uh, from, from a macro standpoint. So 
back in November of the previous year, 2014, the Fed finished off tapering its QE program, so they stopped buying assets. The market held up well, and we started off 2015 where the baton passed over to the ECB. They picked up QE buying about two months later. That led swiftly to one of the most massively crowded trades in history, which is a lot of quant funds all piled into this thing where what they do is they borrow a bunch of euros and they use it to buy German bonds to front run the ECB's buying. And this is a great lesson in sentiment because so many people were piled into the same trade. While it seems like, according to your textbook, financial wisdom, it should work, it, it resulted in the only thing that it could have, which was a massive crash in the German bond market. Rates tripled, quadrupled in days. The U.S. bond market went through something similar. Um, in fact, this was our first big trading game of last year uh, from a macro standpoint. We shorted the 30-year bond futures market and caught pretty much the entire move. After that, Stocks chopped around through the summertime and created the narrowest all-time year-to-date range. A lot of people don't really realize this, but that's, that's true. Last year, from January until basically late July, early August, it was the narrowest market in S&P history for that point in the year. All right, and, and um, it's very significant to what happened next, because with, with any tight market, what happens is a lot of people leverage up a lot. That's how you make money. The market doesn't move much, so you have to trade much bigger size. So you borrow, you do all sorts of things to increase the power of your capital. So people levered up a ton, and we got to a really thin market in August. And the other really significant factor here is at the same time, mutual funds got to their lowest cash levels in history. So you have like a ticking time bomb for a crash, really. Mutual funds, no cash whatsoever, really thin market, and people with increased leverage to play the narrow range. And, of course, what happens, we got a slight uptick in redemption activity in mutual funds, and that set off this cascade. you got futures markets just margin called like crazy for three days, classic Wall Street crash, 10% in three days on the Dow, right? And the big result of that really set in motion this process we've been trading, which is, uh, you know, with, with the type of zeitgeist we have in the market world today, we've got all these big buzzwords like Wall Street fraud and money printing and, ideas like you can't get a sustainable recovery. Um, we got all-time record bearishness coming into the market at that point. Spec interest, future short interest, odd lot short interest, uh, bull market highs in the robo ratio, total put call ratio, spy liquidity premium, the VIX, everything right down the line, really the all-time greatest bearish sentiment moment. So what we did in the chart books is focus on a squeeze and then a rollover. So um, Basically, in a situation like that, the idea being the market has to find a balance. Can you go to the next slide, Mike? Okay. All right, thanks. So, uh, in the September and October chart books, we really focused on the short interest situation and we focused on the need for the market to squeeze. But in the November chart book, we put out a much bigger thesis, which was about divergences. If you could bring that chart book up, Mike, that would be great. Um, Okay. Basically, the situation that we focused on here is you've got the Fed and the ECB diverging like crazy, right? You've got the energy sector diverging off of the rest of the market like crazy. You've got implosion of the commodity production side of the markets, which is really, in the end, was very reminiscent of 2007 in what the financial sector looked like relative to the rest of the market. If you look at a chart of the energy sector right now, and you pair it up to the S&P, and you look at a chart of the uh, financial sector in, in 2007, early 2008, and you pair it up to the S&P, you get a really similar picture. And there were a lot of other great similarities there. Do you see the chart book? Mike? Yeah, yep, we're, we're up on it. Okay, good. Just making sure for some reason I lost it. All right, so, yeah, so you can see, I laid out the case here, basically, that these divergences would really add up to a situation where you're, you're going to get a more protracted more powerful and more important corrective period than we've seen probably over the course of this bull market so far. I mean, that's the case that I made in this chart book. Um, and again, we started with the story so far, and we led to basically these comparisons between 2007 and now. now. I really don't think that the comparison is that valid. It just is in the initial phase. In 2007, the big problem is what you had was an implosion of the credit production side of the economy, and that's more like a heart attack. That's a much more insidious situation. What we have now is, is, you know, more like a problem in the structural side. We've got way too many commodity producers that have built up over a period of the previous decade, and now we're pairing that back a lot. So the implosion is not really systemic. It, it, there's going to be some default, but it's not going to lead, I don't believe, to the situation that we got in 2008 and 2009. However, it does warrant a, 
and more protracted correction and consolidation than we've seen in a while. And that, I think, is exactly what we're starting to trace out right now in the stock market. Can you take me back to the slideshow, Mike, to slide five? So I want to look at the current market situation real quick just to kind of add on to that um, and show you, I think, just three really terrific charts that give you a sense of where we are in the sentiment picture because a big part of what I do has to do with sentiment data. As I've learned okay. over 15 to 20 years ago, Thank you very much, Mike. As, as, as I've learned over 15 to 20 years of this, uh, when you get everybody leaning in the same way, that's never right. It doesn't work out. And when you get a corrective wave, especially one that's sharp like this, and people are making emotional decisions, you usually get to pivots and bounces and sustainable buying points when everybody's kind of all panicking at the same time. So a good way to, to look at a period like this in the market is to, to watch for that. If you're, if you're a potential bull and you're waiting to figure out when to buy, you're looking for real panic before you buy. If you're a bear and you're short and you don't want to cover your whole position, you're looking for real panic to cover. So I'm going to look at three charts to show you the degree to which we're seeing real panic right now. And we're not, trust me. So I'm going to call these the buy the dip indicators. The first one is the robo ratio. We touched on this earlier. It's retail only, buy to open, put call ratio. So smaller traders, less professional traders, initiating opening exposure in the options market. The way that that works out is you can pretty much infer these are home run bear bets. Those guys aren't doing a whole lot of hedging with the options markets. Instead, they've got small accounts and they want to make a fortune. And when they see a big opportunity, they want to use their capital to its fullest extent. And that's the options market. So when you see a, this thing start to spike, you can see every green circle on this chart is a big spike in this ratio. And you can see the first one is the flash crash. The second one is the crash of 2011. The third one is the debt ceiling. And the fourth one is what we saw in August. Right now, meh, right in the middle of the range. People aren't doing anything. That sort of greedy bearishness is just not at all in the market. This is very updated data. Okay, next slide. Okay. The next one here is the Lobo, the Lobo ratio. Uh, this is the large trader only buy to open put call ratio. Now you've got financial professionals, you've got big traders, and you know the options market is really about protection. So this is about fear, right? So are people really panicking? Are people really scared? And once again, pretty much the exact same picture, middle of the range, no big deal. That's where we are right now in this. Okay, one more slide. Okay. Okay, now the final thing I want to look at today as an indication of where we are, and this is called the VIX term structure. Most of you guys probably know the VIX, the fear index, the volatility index of the S&P based on people's expectations of volatility uh, and their bets that are placed in the options market. So um, the VIX term structure is a variation on that. What you do is you take the VIX futures market, which is a derivative of a derivative of a derivative, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the front month futures, and you compare it to the three-month out contract, right? So you're looking for very short-term expectations of volatility versus, say, a quarter away. And that usually is right around 1.0, maybe a little bit less. Usually, you know, it, it, it tends to be a little contango in the VIX market, okay? But when you start to see the front month spike way above the three month out, you get a ratio there if you divide them. And that ratio, when it gets to 2. Point, or 1.25 or 1.1, basically 1.1 and above, you've got panic. 1.25, you've got extreme panic. When people start to say, tomorrow the world's going to end. That's the point you get to. And if you look at the VIX term structure, it's not the VIX. It's the ratio of one VIX to a different VIX. But you can see, based on this chart, you can see the same kind of panic, right? You've got the flash crash. You've got the crash of 2011. You've got what we had in October 2014 showing up there. And, of course, as I said, the all-time king of, of this kind of bearish sentiment panic was what we got last year in August. It's amazing but true. But there, there it is on there, just besides the crash in 2008, of course. So, um, you can see, based on this, based on the last two, how much really irrational, immediate catastrophe insurance, how much panic are we seeing right now in the market? There's nothing, really. I mean, there's nothing. So that makes the case that we have a little ways to go to really trace this out. So can I get another slide, Mike? Okay. And that leads to my current strategy. I'm sitting short the market. I have been since about 36 hours after the Fed came out and raised rates in uh, December. And I'm looking to reload that on a little bit of a bounce, and I'm looking for a target zone basically under 1,800. If you pan back on a weekly chart, that kind of gives you a sense of, you know, a, a big, wide-swinging lateral range consolidation of two to three years 
of the primary leg of this bull market, which was really you know 2010 to the end of 2013. That's when we really made our big sustained middle ground gains. And we're looking to consolidate those gains now. And I think that with the growth in the commodity side of the market, that's kind of spurring it into action here. So one more slide. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mike. Okay. So as I said, here's my current positioning right now. Short the S&P futures from 2063.50 uh, in two entries following the Fed. My stop is back above 2075, and I'm waiting to reload that. I've already taken a little bit off. Um, and I'm sitting short euro right now, and the basis for that is I think that we're going to find out that the Fed is not going to back off from their hawkish rhetoric, even while this correction is going on. And a lot of, I think a lot of people think that they will. And I think that that difference right there, if I'm right, what that means is the market is mispricing right now the upside in the euro. So we're looking to take advantage of that snapping back into place. When somebody on the Fed kind of makes clear that right now the big policy objective is not necessarily equities market inflation, at least not for a bit. So um, – and note, uh, early next week, my new macro chart book will be uh, published to the page. And uh, last slide, Mike. Okay. This is sum up for me. Um, the summary of basically what we just done over here where it comes to accessing uh, the content that I produce. And, and take a look at the webinars. I've done several, but the introduction to futures one is, is really very good. Um, uh, chart trader, the trades and analysis, what I post under my kicker during, during the market in, in real time, as well as trading calls, stops. Uh, entries and exits all in real time. And then the perspective and analysis, again, uh, every morning, 15 minutes before the bell, and um, once a month in the macro chart book. And uh, with that, I will send it back over to Mike, and thank you very much. Thanks, Brett. I also wanted to mention real quick, if anybody has any questions, just fire away in the chat window. So we'll, uh, we'll address it. Okay. So now let's move on to portfolios really quick here. Okay, so go back to the dual one play, which is the default page again. And I'm just going to run through really quick how to set up a, a portfolio. So this is something that uh, a lot of people on the briefing trader service or briefing itself use. So it's really easy. You just click up here in this top tab, portfolios and emails. And you go ahead and click manage portfolios. You can see I've got a few in there already. And you can go ahead and click get started. And we'll just do a, a mock one here really quick. Um, I guess why don't we do FANG, since everyone always talks about FANG, which uh, Facebook, Amazon, Netflix, Google. So we're going to do it by ticker. I click Save and Continue. And it's really simply just add all the tickers. Okay, and then you click Add. And you can see it's added all my tickers from my portfolio. I just click Save and Continue. And then we get to this last page, which is uh, going to be your alerts. And so the nice thing about this is you can really drill down if you just want to the frequency of your alerts. You can get them live, which I have set to. So anytime there's news on anything in my portfolio, Facebook or Amazon, I'll get an alert. Uh, maybe if you don't want them as often, you can just get them every hour or certain times of the day or end of the day. And you can also set up either visual alerts or audio alerts. So a visual will just pop up on the dual and play screen, and audio, uh, a voice will just uh, say Apple, like Siri. So, uh, so that's basically it. Um, you could also, within the topics, you know, uncheck some of these if you're only interested in certain things, or just keep them all checked. So it's your individual preference. So I'm going to go ahead and click Finish on this. And you can see I've got my portfolio saved. So now it's up in here. There's Fang. So, okay, so now we showed you how to do that. Let's go to another, uh, I'm going to head back to the uh, Investing and Trading tab. And this is another one of, uh, I would consider a must read to start your day. So I'm going to click on here on the TA page scans. And this is something that's run daily by uh, Scott Smith, our chief market technician. So I'm going to throw it over to him and let uh, him talk about that a little bit. Thanks, Mike. All right. Uh, so for those of you that don't know me, uh, I post a lot of my um, trading commentary as well as trading ideas under the Blue X ticker on the trading service. And um, generally speaking, I am a swing trader, which means I like to hold positions for 
um, you know, typical uh, few days, and if I have the trend and momentum really going with me, I'm going to carry uh, that a balance of that position for uh, weeks on end, hopefully. Um, you know, if I, I do take positions, I do day trade a little bit uh, if the volatility is really high and I feel like the market conditions are right. Um, but really, I, I've, my main focus is always to look and focus on key price zones. Um, you know, I don't really trade for uh, nickels and dimes or 50 cents moves. I'm looking for points in a lot of my um, trading activity as a swing trader. So I tend to focus around key price zones, whole numbers uh, specifically and uh, moving averages um, support zones, gaps, you know, these are usually uh, one to two point ranges where um, I'm going to try to find on the daily chart or find on a weekly chart, support and resistance or a trend line, and from there, I'm going to wait until I see some sort of signal on maybe the daily chart that's reversing or a 60-minute chart that's sort of reversing, um, suggesting that it's a good shorting opportunity or a low, I should say a low-risk shorting opportunity or a low-risk buying opportunity. And then, uh, you know, if the price starts to move in my favor, then I'm just going to kind of hold, scale out of a, you know, a gain um, plus one, plus two in my profit, plus two in my favor, um, points usually. And um, from there, I'll just kind of just raise all my stops to break even or lower them to break even and just let the balance ride for as long as I can. Um, I do trade options um, specifically on the higher price stocks like Google and Amazon and um you know, Facebook, Apple, anything over $100 is usually the first thing I'm doing is going to look at the options for it. Uh, I tend to trade at the money and in the money options because they have less time decay. And I usually go about one month out from the uh, current month. Um, you know, again, this is swing trading. I'm not looking to make some sort of investment on it. Uh, and hopefully my timing is within a day or two of my entry is, you know, accurate that um, that everything starts to move in my favor uh, real quick. If it doesn't, then I start to, um, you know, reassess the whole situation and I'll just start taking my losses as necessary. Uh, but this one page here, the TA scans page, um, this is a this is a page that I came up with probably about 10 years ago. And it initially came out of the, my need to really kind of just zone in and find what is the overall um, view or sentiment or feel of the market on a technical basis. And so what I did is I just took these basic uh, textbook technical analysis patterns like pullbacks, stocks that have run up for three or three three days in a row or down three days in a row, um, an inside day, uh, a doji pattern, which is where the open and close is really tight on a day or a week. Um, overbought is where they're just uh, stocks that are just up over five days in a row uh, significantly or same with oversold down five days significantly. Uh, breakouts is basically above a significant resistance and breakdowns would be below a significant support um, on heavy volume and on a wide range day. Um, tight consolidations, uh, you know, these are stocks that are kind of just sitting in the middle of a, a multi-week range. Um, usually there is a series of uh, inside days that are going on there. Uh, and then the other ones are just kind of your, tw your basic 20-day, 50-day, 100-day, 200-day moving average averages. Um, the zippers, uh, this came out of a demand for people who were interested in trading lower price stocks. It's not really my forte, but obviously there was a need for it. And so what I did is there is a um, – I created a scan that seeks out the strongest um, st stocks on an um, absolute basis – um, that are trading below twenty dollars, and if you go through any of these charts, these stocks that are here, um, they tend to be in significant uptrends already. Which, if this is your um, area that you're interested in, I would recommend just kind of focusing on the twenty-day moving average or the fifty-day moving average, identifying pullbacks and support levels in these names, and uh, just kind of going with a swing position in those things. If they start to break down below key support levels, trend lines, moving averages. Uh, you know, get out as fast as you can um, because these things are usually um, short-lived momentum names. Um, bang for your buck. Uh, this is basically if you have no clue what to be trading on a daily basis from a day trading perspective or from a swing trading perspective, but you're looking for the stocks that are really volatile, um, you know, rather than trading your Microsofts or your GEs, um, you know, or Verizons or AT&Ts, like the old Bellwether stocks, um, you know, these are going to be the ones that really kind of, uh, you know, pack the most punch, uh, so to speak. 
um, for your trading opportunities if you're really trying to make those um, multiple points and short-term gains from a day trading perspective. Um, I would suggest analyzing most of these stocks on an intraday basis, um, you know, five-minute charts, 30-minute uh, charts, and 60-minute charts, uh, because they do tend to have a daily range of um, usually greater than three to four points. Uh, the last signal, and this is actually probably one of the more important ones, is uh, I came up with a proprietary momentum or trend signal on the spiders, the SPY ETF. And um, this, the basic premise of this is not, it's not a mechanical, none of these are strict like buy and sell signals. You can't just go out the next day and blindly purchase these or short these stocks. That's not how it works. Um, again, this is just uh, the computers that I run, the scans that I run every day, they're just kind of spitting out this mechanical thing of what the patterns look like. Um, you still have to do your own interpretation of the bigger picture of what the market conditions are. Um, but what's great about this table is that it kind of just gives you a real sense of um, the patterns that are developing and where the sentiment is and where the money's flowing in and out of. Um, my momentum signal, so it's been on a red signal probably since, uh, I want to say it's been on there since mid-December uh, when everything started getting a little uh, wonky in the market there around the holidays. It's flipped to a red signal, which really kind of uh, gave me a heads up that I should be reducing my share size. Now, this is one of the first ways. I'm, pre I'm pretty much a really conservative trader, but um, when I see these signals go to red, I really start cutting back on the share size that I'm trading, uh, less than half the normal size, and I start scaling in uh, you know, at certain levels, trading only a third, maybe even a quarter. Um, I just become really, really skeptical about the current market conditions. Um, when it's on a yellow, that's more of a neutral phase. The market's kind of just going flat or sideways in some sort of uh, weekly range that's developing, and that's what, kind of what we've started to see happening throughout November and December. And, um, you know, and in a neutral environment, that's when you really kind of have to take into context which one of these um, setups uh, on a technical basis are going to be the best ones. So if we're in a range, if it, if it was yellow, um, and the market's down two, three, four days in a row, and you see there's a, say, there's a moving average there um, of sorts or support level, well, then you're probably going to want to be more focused on the shallow pullback longs of stocks that are still in stronger uptrends and they're pulling back. Or you might want to be focused on power down days, power down uh, candidates, stocks that are down three days. Um, perhaps maybe even an inside day is worthwhile looking at, or a doji day, um, or an oversold level, because you're still in that range. And um, breakouts might even be significant uh, during the lower end of a range as well, because they're showing relative strength. And so when the market does rally off of support, you anticipate that all these bullish setups, setups are going to start uh, leading the way higher. You know, and it's vice versa here in, the, in um, the last few weeks since we went to a red signal. You know, you really kind of want to avoid all the ones that are in green, which are bullish, mechanically bullish um, setups. You know, you want to be focused more on the ones that are red. Um, there have been very few power-ups the last few weeks, which is stocks that have been running up three days or higher. Um, you know, there's been a few inside days, which maybe, you know, it's more of a, a neutral uh, stance there, but perhaps they're worth, a, um, you know, a shorting opportunity if they start to slip lower. Uh, doji days as well is also kind of a neutral reading, but since we're in a negative signal, you're going to want to focus on the short side of these if they start taking out lows. Um, you know, overbought has specifically been these um, leverage contrarian ETFs, the energy ETFs, the small cap ETFs. And obviously, that's just describing the current state of the market, that energy stocks are really absolutely getting pummeled here. Um, you don't just run out and start um, shorting blindly any of these things. They're just kind of telling you what the market's going to. Oversold, we have a lot of energy names here <clears throat> as well. Um, you know, and just kind of telling you what's going on here. Um, if this signal was green and I had a whole bunch of oversold names in a particular group, well, then, of course, I'd be looking to buy them. But since we're in a red momentum down signal, this is really kind of just telling you where that um, momentum is going. I'm not really a fan of shorting stocks that are down more than five days in a row and seem stretched on a weekly basis. Um, so I'm, I'm, this is really the energy sector for me is kind of a do nothing right now. Um, you know, you really have to be – you're kind of treading on um, – on uh, thin ice when you're starting to trade these names. There's plenty of volatility there, um, but I just, um, for me as a swing trader, I don't see uh, many opportunities right there right now that I like setting up in too many um, energy stocks. 
Um, again, breakouts, we haven't seen, you can just kind of compare the, the number of breakouts and number of breakdowns on a daily basis. And I can tell you right now that the breakdowns have been ex far exceeding the uh, number of breakouts for a good number of weeks um, now. Um, you know, I do not include all of them. I mean, the numbers are going to be much, much larger. Some days I have 90, 100 plus, you know, on the breakdowns as of late. Uh, so they are filtered out for the highest volume and the ones at the widest ranges and stuff. Um, but generally, I'll try to <clears throat> filter them out so the concept gets across that there are a significant amount more of uh, bullish or bearish setup in the markets. Um, you know, again, if you see a number of tight consolidations or inside weeks or doji weeks developing, that's going to tell you that there's more of a, uh, a neutral uh, con neutral range going on over the last uh, couple of days, and uh, the market's probably prone to be breaking out soon, either to the upside or downside. And uh, you know, that's this is basically my um, my go-to page that I analyze the market with every night. Um, you know, for, for looking at individual names and looking for opportunities. Outside of this, I also um, take a look at a lot, I take a macro approach looking at the major indices, um, you know, starting with the S&P, the, the Dow, the NASDAQ, the small caps, and uh, as well as the uh, individual sector ETFs from the XLE, uh, energy, to industrials, financials, utilities, you know, just go through all the S&P 500 um, main sectors. And I take a really simplistic approach. Um, if it's trading below 50-day moving average, 200-day moving average, or 20-day moving average, you know, I just assume that it's bearish and that the, the burden is on the buyers to lift those stocks back into uptrends. Um, you know, and it just, it's just a simple analysis that I like to take, and I try to just look for opportunities. If they're below the 50-day moving average, I want to be focused on shorting stocks. If they're above the 50-day moving average, I want to be focused on um, buying stocks. Um, it's really kind of that simple approach that I like to take in the market. Hopefully it gets across. Um, and uh, I think that pretty much wraps up about what I have to say for today. Um, Mike, okay. what's next? Uh, Thanks, Scott. A lot of good stuff in there. Yep. Okay. I'm just going to move back to the do and play here real quick and show two more uh, quick tips help everyone get around the site. Okay. And one thing I am going to wanted to mention really quick, which is one of the favorite uh, features of a briefing trader, and something you really won't find in other services, is the, uh, the access to the analysts and traders and the ability to talk to them. So just as uh, Scott had a lot to talk about there, uh, if you ever have a question, you go up here at the top, you click on Talk to Us, and you can direct your question to a particular trader, either, say, Scalp or BlueX or Comdex, and then just put your email here in the bottom, hit go, and somebody will get back to you real shortly. And the other option you could also do is just email us directly. You can email briefingtrader at briefing.com. So, and then in addition to that, if you have a more detailed question or you wanted to uh, talk to an analyst, we could set that up and set up a separate uh, conference call. So that's uh, just a real nice benefit of the briefing trader service, the ability to access the analyst and, and talk to them. And along those lines as well, I just wanted to uh, mention another good tip here is if you go into the search field, so if you're curious about each trader, maybe their background, how they got started, you can go up here in the search field and type in style, S-T-Y-L-E, and we're going to hit enter, and it's just going to give you a really good background and rundown on every trader. So I'll tell you about, you know, their style. Uh, here's Blue X here. You can see his risk reward. As he mentioned, he's more of a swing or overnight trader. His position sizing, entry and exit. We have setup X here. Scalp is going to be more short-term oriented, as designated by the ticker. So just uh, when you have some time, check this out. You type in style in the search field, and uh, it'll basically just help you to get a better feel about each trader and maybe match them with your own trading style. And Okay, so now I'm going to let Mike uh, Ciccarelli, who trades in our Comdex, Share his thoughts on oil, uh, when it might potentially bottom, and then talk a little bit about some potential uh, value in the energy field. Hi, everyone. I'm Mike Ciccarelli. I'm known on our trader site as Commodities Trader, and I post under the ticker COMDX. Today, I wanted to talk a little about the global oil markets and some related stocks. As we've seen, the price of oil continues to drop sharply, and there appears to be no bottom in sight. 
Yesterday, WTI oil prices fell below $30 per par for barrel for the first time since December 2003. In short, the bearish trend is just to continue. The world oil market is still in oversupply uh, mode, and oil demand growth is slowing even more. Uh, demand growth likely peaked in the third quarter at 2.2 million barrels per day, and early indicators from the International Energy Agency for the fourth quarter shows even further growth at 1.3 million barrels per day. But even worse for the for the full year here, 2016, demand growth is expected to uh, slip even further. Currently, estimates are about 1.2 million barrels per day. Uh, oil producer capital spending has been cut notably since 2014, and that's been another big driver weighing on a lot of the uh, energy space. And one key figure that this affects is the U.S. oil rig count, which is down sharply since the recent peak, which was in October 2014. Since then, the rig count is down 68%, which is obviously a huge move. This affects um, a big thing, a big area this affects is companies that provide a, just the equipment and service areas. Um, ultimately, there's no real bullish catalyst currently in sight or on the horizon for oil prices, but that doesn't mean that we won't see some short term squeezes that higher for now. But if we do, they're going to be, uh, I expect them to be very brief. Overall, though, what we do have is a lot of variables to monitor that will help us identify an inflection point in the oil market. Some of those issues and stories in the oil market for this year I like to make light of is uh, China, the oversupply situation, the strong dollar, Iran, the U.S. Uh, oil export ban that's recently been lifted, OPEC, and U.S. oil production. On the topic of China, that's obviously been a huge driver in the market lately. And when it comes to the oil market, this is one driver wing on oil prices, is the broad market weakness of China. Also, China consumes 12% of the world's oil, so weakness in the overall Chinese economy clearly threatens oil demand, and that's what we've been seeing. Even worse, the EIA says that in the next five years, about half of the oil global oil demand growth was expected to come from China, and this trend was, uh, it was continued set through the year 2040. So obviously, with big weakness in China, it's going to have a big effect in oil. On to the oversupply situation, the global glut in oil came largely from a spike in U.S. oil production due to the shale exploration. Just in the past six years, U.S. oil production has nearly doubled, and basically what that does is created a situation where the U.S. was ex importing a lot less oil and then forcing these other areas in the Middle East and other countries to then look for other buyers for the oil and they were forced to reduce prices, weighing on overall oil prices, mostly Brent and WTI. On top of the, the supply issue there, OPEC decided in late 2014 to not reduce output and operate as a swing producer as they always have in the past. That was a big game changer, being that for decades, you know, to be clear, OPEC's always operated as a swing producer. Out of nowhere, they basically decided to want to focus more on market share and not balance the market. There's no indication that they really will at this point. If they do, one, there's one fact is that they will not do it without at least a few other countries participating. Some countries such as Russia, the U.S., Mexico, they want to do a coordinated cut. Overall, though, on the oversupply situation, the global oil market has been oversupplied by about one to two million barrels, <clears throat> one to two million barrels per day. But even worse, unfortunately, that oversupply is expected to worsen in 2016. Just to give a little idea of how much oil is being used and where oversupply may be is, I just want to note that current estimates for the full year of total world oil supply is expected to come in around 97 million barrels per day, while demand is just over 94 million barrels per day. So you can see the clear oversupply situation. Another big topic on that note of the current oversupply situation we have is the recent sanctions that have been lifted in Iran. Iran's one of the bigger stories in the oil market right now since the U.S. talked about lifting sanctions. Uh, in July of last year, there was a nuclear deal with Iran and other world powers, which included lifting the sanctions, and this included easing sanctions on its oil and gas sector. Currently, Iran produce, produces about 2.8 million barrels per day of oil, and they export, export about uh, just over a million of that. <clears throat> The, the the problem is with the sanctions lifted, 
Iran could produce and export more, and depending on what they do, it's going to make a huge difference in the oil market during this year. But since last fall, they made a few comments about what they were due, which is created some serious volatility in the oil market. So when they were told the sanctions would be lifted, they initially said that they would raise their oil exports by a million barrels per day within one year, and that's a huge number. But more recently, given some conflict with Saudi Arabia, <clears throat> they just recently came out publicly saying they don't really want a price war with Saudi Arabia and will most likely produce um, oil just only if the demand's there for it. But unfortunately, this is a thing we have to wait and see how it plays out. And actually, the end of January, the uh, 28th or 29th, there is when their actual date is that they could start actually implementing this higher production and higher exports. Another big topic recently was the U.S. Ex oil export ban being lifted. This is a really huge deal, but this can go a number of ways. So for now, it's just since it just began, it's something we, we need to spend a little time on to get a better feel of how much may be exported. It Ultimately, lifting the export ban is positive for WTI oil prices, but if it turns out to be small amounts for a number of months, it's not going to have much effect on, an, on the oil market. Lastly, a big uh, issue and story I want to talk about that's going on in the oil market is obviously OPEC. is one of the largest catalysts affecting oil prices. They met last December and kept their production on change again, and they meet twice per year, so they'll be uh, meeting next in June. If you remember last year, it was the, last, uh, the end of 2014 is when they started to keep production when it was the market. Everyone pretty much expected them to apply some kind of uh, production cut. Maybe similar to in 07 and 08, they agreed to a total production cut, coming out announcing that they were going to cut 4.2 million barrels from the global oil market, and that's obviously a huge move. Uh, recently, there were rumors about an emergency OPEC meeting, but we've heard these rumors before, and usually this so far always turns out to be nothing, so it's nothing we're trading on. Just to give a little perspective, OPEC uh, is currently producing 31.7 million barrels per day, so it's clearly a big driver. In total, they produce about a third of the world's output. Um, and OPEC, they issue a monthly report, which provides a lot of good color on the state of OPEC and the world oil market, and the next uh, monthly report will come out on January 18th. Um, just a quick bottom line on oil prices is that the most likely situation we see is oil falling below $30 per barrel. There's way too many bearish catalysts going on. There's, there's way too many variables that are unknown. Iran is one of them. It seems fair to say that it'll turn out to be just a very slight, a moderately bearish catalyst, but if they do anything like they've talked about in the past, dropping half a million, one million barrels onto the of a market, which is, is possible, that's going to hurt prices even more, even though it's hard to believe that oil can fall even further, but it's definitely possible. So, unfortunately, I'm not expecting oil prices to remain weak and fall below $30 and remain there for a little while. We're going to see short-term rallies which from like some short squeezes from one possible good data point, but I expect these to be very short. Um, again, with Iran, just it's one of the biggest catalysts right now, and we ultimately just need to give a little time to see. We just need a little more color on it to see, get more assurance that they're not going to flood the market with uh, with oil. Um, lastly, of course, on top of that is the current combination uh, combined variables of OPEC and the weakness in China. Altogether, that's really killing oil prices. Lastly, I want to <clears throat> just talk for a minute on some things I look for with the oil and gas companies. Uh, in the current environment, every bull and bear market is uh, it's always different. In the current environment we're in, we need to be extremely careful because there will definitely be more bankruptcies in the oil industry in the coming months. And just in general, the oil market is in a very uh, fragile state. So what I'm doing is looking at higher quality names of course, with the occasional speculative trade in there, but overall, I'm looking at higher quality names in the oil and gas space. Um, in the upstream area, just I'm looking for companies with really solid balance sheets. Aside from that, location of their properties is very key. There's many basins in North America that are very solid producing properties. Also, 
a trend that's been helping U.S. oil and gas companies is the, the drilling efficiency. It's they've gotten they've become much more efficient than basically any industry analyst has anticipated, where they can drill almost twice as many wells with the same amount of rigs just from a year ago. Also, I look, a couple of other things I look at is the internal rate of return on a company's well and get an idea of what their payback period uh, is. Um, on that note, uh, three, a few names I'd like to mention that I like for 2016 is EOG, QEP, and PXD. These are names, these uh, companies I mentioned here have the qualities that I'm looking for, and currently these remain three of my top, uh, top picks. Lastly, the related ETF, a little more diversified, for the exploration and production area of the oil and gas space, so this would be the upstream part, is the uh, the S&P oil and gas exploration and production, uh, and the ticker is XOP. That's another one that's on my long runner. And that tracks about 75 U.S. oil and gas producers. So, well, that's all for me, and I thank you, everyone, for listening. And I'll okay. put it back to Mike. Thanks, Mike. Um, yeah, and remember, if you have any questions, just ask uh, via the chat. So... Um, now I'm going to toss it over to uh, Damon, who I know has been licking his chops at some of these big opportunities here in the uh, energy sector. So we'll let him talk for a little bit about that and uh, how to trade some of this recent volatility. Hi, thanks for joining us today. My name is Damon Southward. Uh, I go by the handle Scout Trader. And, um, you know, going into the financial crisis, uh, 2008 uh, or so, you know, I focus pretty much almost exclusively on trading intraday. Um, but as financial companies started to melt down and I started to look at the various uh, portions of their capital structure, I realized that there could be some compelling opportunities, um, especially as pretty much everything was thrown overboard. Um, you know, companies that actually were making money, uh, that seemed to be, you know, digging out financially. I mean, their stocks were still down 99%, 98%. Their preferred uh, shares were down 90 95%. And so I'm kind of looking at the energy crisis in a similar, from a similar standpoint. You know, looking across the capital structure, doing a lot of research to try to understand, you know, where that fulcrum security is, where the be most compelling opportunity uh, will be once we get to the bottom of this energy collapse. And so part of that process is going through looking at literally almost every individual energy company and trying to determine their approach to salvaging the enterprise. So one of the things you're seeing right now is a lot of companies are going in and either buying their debt directly out of the market. So when people start to talk about energy companies and their levels of debt, there are their, their debt levels are really high. But one of the interesting things you're seeing that you're not actually hearing people talk about is the fact that the bonds of these companies have fallen to, in many, many cases, 15 to 20 cents on the dollar. And right before coming in here, uh, there's a bond that I've been paying attention to that have been trading at around 20 cents on the dollar. And suddenly, uh, over the past couple of days, it's traded up to 30 cents on the dollar with a fair amount of volume in it, which to me, I think that, you know, my, the indication to me is that the company is in there buying debt out of the market at 30 cents on the, on the dollar. Other companies are actually going in and doing debt exchanges. So, for example, you know, given you know, holders who bought the bonds at par and may have sold them at 50 cents on the dollar or 40 cents on the dollar, uh, you're seeing speculators come in and buy them at 20, 25 cents on the dollar. So basically a changeover of the base, of the uh, holder base. And so if a company comes and says, okay, we'll give you – New bonds, we're going to buy them back from you at 40 cents on the dollar or 35 cents on the dollar. Well, that's found money, and they're going to also, you know, give you new bonds at maybe a higher interest rate as well. So, um, you know, they're essentially able to go in and swap out that debt at lower prices and eliminate a lot of the debt off the balance sheet. So that's one of the things I'm really paying attention to. I mean, obviously, you're going to see a lot of companies that file for bankruptcy during this process. And what you're seeing with the individual stock prices across the energy space is that everything is getting pushed overboard. So if one upstream MLP has negative news, all of the upstream MLPs sell off. But there are differenti there are differences between the you know the various structures. I mean, some have hedges. 
that will protect their cash flow for the next two, three, four years. Some of their, most of the companies, their hedges fall off dramatically in 2016, and if oil prices and natural gas prices stay at their current levels, they will be bankrupt by the end of 2016. So the opportunity that I'm looking for is to try to find those attractive names that are getting thrown out, you know, baby with the bathwater type of scenario. And uh, so this will be an ongoing process. I think there will be opportunities um, to, you know, really make, you know, really good money. I mean, I look back at the financial crisis, and, you know, then I was, I was more, you know, almost exclusively, you know, a day trader. But I started doing research then from kind of a distressed perspective. And I look at the names that, that I bought and sold way too early. And my goal this time is not to do that again. So, I mean, I bought Ford at a dollar and it traded to 16. I bought general growth properties at 27 cents. It traded to $27. You know, I bought Fifth Third Bank at a dollar. It traded to $20. So, you know, all those names I did well on, you know, thinking, oh, I made 100% or 200%. Well, you know, I could have made thousands of percent. So, uh, you know, my goal this time is to do the, do the research and then make sure that I'm patient, uh, you know, with some of these names because uh, I think even on the equity side, there's going to be some compelling opportunities for situations where the companies actually reduce their debt by buying it in the open market or doing debt exchanges. And at some point, natural gas prices are going to rebound, oil prices are going to rebound, and um, you know, you'll see companies actually be able to go in and actually during this process start to buy additional properties as well that they're buying at distressed prices. So once you do get the rebound in the commodities, the oil and natural gas, I mean, those new properties come online, uh, cash flow looks significantly better. All of a sudden, you have a company that was trading at 40 cents. You know, they have a distribution yield of 40 percent, and um, they're starting to actually increase the distribution. Or their preferreds might be trading at three cents on the dollar, and they actually have the cash to continue to pay that preferred. Uh, on the on the preferred side, one of the interesting things about many of the preferreds in the energy space that you didn't see in the financial space is that the preferreds are cumulative. With financials, most of the companies, their preferreds, they could suspend the distributions and not have to make up the payments. But in the energy space, most of, most of the preferreds are uh, cumulative, so that even if they suspend them for a year or two years, uh, before they can ever pay another penny in uh, common share distributions, they have to make up all of the payments on the preferreds. So you may literally be able to get two years' worth of payments on, on a preferred if you buy it at the right price. And I think there will be some of these names that are $25 preferreds that are trading at $0.50 cents or a dollar that at some point they'll uh, resume the distribution and you'll get a, you know, a 5 or $6 cash payment. But once that occurs, once they resume the distribution, the preferred will probably trade to 12 to 15 to 18 bucks, and maybe eventually back to par. I mean, you saw that in a number of cases in the, in, during the financial crisis uh, through for financial companies, insurance companies, real estate companies. Um, so it's, it's going to be an interesting opportunity. Uh, stay tuned. I mean, we're not even, you know, we're not close to the, to the end game here. I mean, it's going to be a process, a shakeout process, uh, but I think it's one of those opportunities, one of those kind of, you know, almost once in a lifetime opportunity. So, all right. Well, thanks again for your time, and uh, hope you enjoy your service. Thanks, Damon. Okay. Uh, one thing I just wanted to stress really quick before we wrap up is kind of what I think will be a big theme this year, and that's active versus passive investing. So, in the previous years, everyone's just kind of bought some ETFs, usually SPY or a few select stocks, and basically went to sleep for the year and waited for their positive returns. You know, wondering, would, would it be 10%, 15%, 20%, or even more? So we're coming off a flat 2015. We've really seen volatility ramp up this year and some chaos come to the markets. So, and this is basically going to create some huge, huge opportunities in 2016 that the trader subscribers will be able to take advantage of. So, and, you know, this is where these guys really excel. They've all been successfully trading for a long time, and their daily active approach and insight is going to pay off the most when these markets just get messy like they are now. So you have a team of 30 analysts, 10 traders with Briefing Trader that are going to be working every day to give you that investing and trading edge. So just keep that in mind. And, uh, okay, that will basically do it. 
Thank you everyone for attending the webinar.